Welcome everybody. In this video, we are going to cover the monoid. It is a mathematical concept, however, can be implemented as a pattern in programming languages. Today, we're going to discuss the idea that the monoid is, why it is useful, and specifically, this video is a precursor to the monad video that I'm going to do later on. By understanding why monoids as a pattern is useful in the functional programming world, we will then later understand why we want to use monads. So let's start. What is a monoid? A monoid is a set equipped with associative binary operation and an identity element. Okay, so that's the definition here. A monoid is a set. So we have a collection of things. These can be cups, walls, different types of doors, different types of numbers, right? So we have a set of things, it's essentially a collection, but you only have unique values in there uh, with an associative binary operation. So all that means is that we can combine these objects in some way. So let's say we our our set our cups. So if you've ever seen those videos where kids, uh, what's it called, take the cups and they like stack them up into pyramids and the, they like set wor world records with that stuff. If we take the cups and we combine them, so uh, the binary operator, like adding the numbers. So if we have one and one, we add the two together, we have two. If we have the objects, which are cups, the associative element is essentially if we first combine the bottom two cups and then add the third one, uh, that's the order. Like, so that's the end result that we get three cups stacked on top of each other. We then unstack them and we stack the top two first and then the last bottom one on top of it as well, we still end up with the same result of having three cups stacked on top of each other, right? So we are combining some elements from the set, right? There can be tons of cups. And we have an identity element. So an identity element is like a zero. I am not sure what that would be in terms of cups, maybe thin air, but essentially if we have one or if we have two, if we add zero to one, we will have one. If we have two, and we add zero to that, we have two. So that's the identity element. If we have cups, uh, so if we have an identity element for the cup, if we had a cup and we put the identity element on top of it, we still have the cup. So that's the identity element. So having those three things essentially builds up the monoid. So that's from the definition. Uh, let's jump in into what it is in the code, right? First of all, kind of like, Taking a look at numbers, we have one, we add, we basically add one, <laughs> we add the numbers, plus is a monoid, it doesn't matter if we add these ones first, it doesn't matter if we add these ones first, the end result will always be the same, it doesn't matter which uh, operation gets performed first. Same thing with the OR operation, and by the way, as discussed previously, the zero is the identity here. Uh, with the Boolean operations, we have an OR or AND, Please note, these are different monoids. So OR and PLUS operators are monoids in the OR operation. False will be the identity. So if we have TRUE or FALSE, we have TRUE. If we have FALSE or FALSE, we have FALSE. With TRUE, if we will have the opposite thing, TRUE will be the identity. So if we have FALSE and TRUE, we have FALSE. If we have TRUE and TRUE, we have true. Okay. So hopefully again, thinking back to the cups, if we have a cup and we put the identity on top of it, we still have the cup. So if you can apply that to further constructs like functions and we combine them together, we're going to get bigger functions. Now in functional programming, because functions is all you have in object oriented programming, we sort of have only objects. Our system is a composition of smaller objects, composed together, the, the objects interact between each other. And that builds up our system, our server, our API, it takes in data, it processes it, it saves it to the database, whatever it does work with it, right. So we take many objects, and we put them together. And this is a big thing about how do these objects interact. So in uh, object oriented programming, it's, uh, you know, you have to think about like, how do you get an inside the pattern, you're gonna do like dependency injection, we have to whatever we, we have a bunch of problems there about how these objects are going to be interacting with functional programming, they have these functional programming patterns that essentially allow you to sort of same as these numbers are sort of going to eliminate into this last final number, 
we want to take all functions or if we are an object oriented language, we want to take all objects and sort of go and there is our system. And monoid is primarily trying to achieve composition between functions. So we can try to remember to the composite design pattern for our objects. If we can have a binary operator for that, so if we take two composite objects, we combine them together, we get a bigger composite object that if we trigger a function on it, it's going to perform the two other operations of the other composite objects. That is essentially a monoid, we call it composite. A monoid here would be combining functions, combining operations, combining different things and still having that identity thing, right? So how is it useful? Again, as I said, we take smaller things as we have a big problem, we solve the problem, we chunk it up into smaller problems. And now if we have a function that solves each individual problem, uh, like tasks, like functions, cloud functions, virtual machines, if they are developed in a monoid way where it doesn't matter if these complete first or these complete first, we can distribute the workload across all the virtual machines, all the cloud functions, whatever. Uh, you can essentially just go spider out the work across your infrastructure and then in the end, so I, I, I do, it does show like as, as if these are all individual things, tasks would live in a CPU process where it's running, these would live in your cloud infrastructure and whatever is calling the invocation of these functions would then have to aggregate the result, okay? So there is still a sort of a master process leaning over these that triggers these. So as long as you're able to combine these, you're fi following the monoid pattern. I feel a little bit wrong saying monoid patterns, you're essentially making monoids. So uh, enough rambling on, let's take a look at how you can implement this. So the first step is in functional programming. Uh, it's a little bit easier because in functional programming, everything is a function. So if we have A, if we have five, if we have 10, five is a function that returns itself, which is the five, 10 is a function that returns itself, right? So these are functions evaluating themselves. So as soon as we do this, we already kind of get functional composition, which will be monoid. So we have the number, we add the five to it, we have 10. We will push away from that side, but just uh, just understand that's how functional programmers think. Everything is a function, okay? So we wanna arrive at this place where we have the add five, we have the add 10, we wanna combine these two functions and we want to build up add 15. Ultimately, we can unpack these functions and we can create a totally new function, but we already have the building blocks. We want to combine these, right? So we can kind of step into it slowly. We can replace this with the add five and then we can replace 10 with add 10, right? You can see what we're doing here. We're defining an in place Lambda. And this is essentially the operator of the monoid. This is probably something that you have written a thousand times, right? The thing that is missing here is like the tools that you give yourself in order to use this as the baseline for your programming. So let's step into that place where we do have the tools, all right? So add five plus add 10, we have add 15, right? So we have two functions, we just add them together and then we can execute the function. So unfortunately, func interface is a delegate, you can't extend it, you can't do things with it, right? Here you can see I am overloading the plus operator for the function, so I create a custom type, I essentially wrap my function and because this function is like a function in the end this sort of hints at the composite design pattern in the end okay i'm kind of using it to do that and because plus you will not always be able to get away with having a plus as your operator i am including the then function which will act as a plus or my binary operator a binary operator has to take two values, although with, right here, the first value is the object itself, right? Uh, it is a little bit more clear here where we have the extension then function, where the first parameter is this function and the second parameter is the other function, right? So essentially, instead of having something like one plus one, we have a more lispy approach of plus one one, but instead we are adding functions like so. And that's essentially it for the implementation. Not much here. This is how a monoid would look like. And uh, imagine these are not functions, these are tasks, or 
more like overloaded tasks, the tasks that you personally have created. Now you want to distribute the workload across a system or a processor. And um, these would come back in order or it wouldn't matter which one's complete first sort of thing. Now let's take a look at the rules. Uh, so we did mention that it's basically a set, it has associativity, and then we have the identity. So just take a look at how it would look like in this scenario. We have the function type, it still has the function run that it holds, we have the function itself, we still have the function type, we have the function that it holds, and again the overloaded operator. So the collection of things, my set, is a set of functions. So set of functions that specifically operate on an integer, right? So this is my set, this is my collection, this is the place in which I'm working, this is my domain, all right? This is my set, and uh, the first rule is the binary operator, right? So how can I combine my things? So this is the first rule, and then the second rule is the rules for the first rule, right? So collection of things, the combination operator, and now a couple of rules about how we can combine these things or what happens when we attempt to combine them. Or not combine, thinking combine is only sort of adding things. What we want to think about is the binary operation, the raw abstraction. You can, as long as the raw abstraction of this, whatever this implements, applies these laws, it's still a monoid and you will get the expected behavior from it. So what do we have? We have add five, we have subtract three, we have add 10. It doesn't matter if we perform this first or we perform this first, we always get the same result in the end, right? So let me bring this up here. And this may look a little bit uh, weird because we're doing number operations, but in functions, but in reality, what we're doing is we're doing functional composition, right? And this is why if, if you're trying to look behind like the shroud, but essentially, yeah, there are functions behind it that we're combining. So uh, this is the function combination. Uh, again, uh, looking a little bit further here, we have multiply by three, then we do division and multiply. So we're combining these two functions first, then these two functions, and then we're adding this function. It's the same as adding these functions and doesn't matter if we just decide to combine these two functions in the middle, that doesn't matter, right? And then the identity function, hopefully you can see it there. That is my zero. Uh, it doesn't matter what gets passed to it. It's just, it's just going to spit out the same value, right? So divide seven plus, plus the identity or identity plus divide seven. It doesn't matter which way we combine it. This function really doesn't do anything. And I mean, it acts as a zero. That's sort of the identity. And it acts as a zero only in uh, this scenario or, or maybe even some other scenarios, but ho hopefully you get the picture. Those are equal. Uh, basically, the identity has no effect. And just as a closing note, if you think of a plus and a multiply, they would have different identities. A plus would have an identity of a zero. So one plus zero is one, two plus zero is two. If we have multiplication, one multiplied by one is one and two multiplied by one is two, right? So the identity for multiplication is two. And so plus and multiplication are different monoids, right? So a set of things can have different monoids with different identities. And again, remember that ultimately what we're doing is we're building up small things that we're trying to compose together to build up a system. And that is just how problems get solved in the functional programming world. In our object-oriented world, we have objects that we're building up the interaction between together. Hopefully this clears up the monoid picture for you. Again, this is a precursor to monads. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. And as always, have a good day.